Uh, first of all, uh, a couple disappointments with the day. Um, where's John? Six to three? I mean, I'm, clearly we're going to win the case six to three, not the other side. The second is, I always thought I was Governor Schwarzenegger's right arm. Uh, it was sort of disappointing to hear that instead, uh, Mary Nichols. Anyway, uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, with everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, USD for hosting uh, this great event, and especially uh, Leslie McAllister, uh, a brilliant uh, young scholar who's doing very important work uh, in this area. It's quite wonderful to be at an event uh, on this topic uh, at this time with such a group of terrific uh, scholars, government officials, and practicing uh, lawyers. I have a lot of old friends uh, here, which is particularly uh, fun. Mike Reed was a colleague of mine uh, in the Lands Division years ago, but academics from more recent times um, Joe Demento, who actually I met back at the Justice Department years ago, um, Ann Carlson, um, Bill Busby, uh, Alice Thurston, Victor Flatt, and of course, no one goes back quite as far as Dan Farber and I, and we went to high school together in Urbana, Illinois, which I always mention whenever we're on a panel uh, together. Uh, my assignment today is to offer uh, some kind of a wrap-up uh, in the form of concluding remarks. I expect each of you have taken away some different things uh, from today. I'm going to give you mine. Uh, these are my three takeaway points. Uh, first, we should not kid ourselves about the lawmaking challenges we now face. Uh, they're huge. Second, uh, universities in general, and the legal academy in particular, has potential to play a critically important role in determining how best to meet uh, those challenges. Uh, and third, as large as those challenges are, it will be a serious mistake to view this as a federal or state law issue rather than as a federal and state law issue. Uh, and that presents some special opportunities for lawmaking and for institutional innovation. All right, so what do I mean by my first? Uh, let's not kid ourselves about the lawmaking challenge and how I think they're huge. In the immediate aftermath of the Bush administration's departure, uh, the first step seemed deceptively easy. Uh, the Bush administration offers a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, it makes addressing greenhouse gases look really easy uh, because the government in the last few years did so little, and what little they did, they did so poorly. Uh, and that's why the first steps come quite easily. They provide so much hope and so much reason for optimism. So it's easy now to cheer as the first fruit is plucked in the first few weeks, and one can and should cheer. But there are things like withdrawal of the mercury petition, not a greenhouse gas issue, but that was pretty fun to see happen. It was one of the more uh, unmeritorious rulemakings ever. Uh, the move now towards reversal of the California waiver petition denial, uh, President Obama putting out his memorandum within the first seven days of his administration, uh, followed by a carefully written uh, notice in the Federal Register by Administrator Jackson in EPA's formal announcement of reconsideration of that, done very carefully uh, to avoid any possible violation of the Administrative Procedure Act and notions of being directed by the White House. Uh, more recently, a move uh, by Administrator uh, Jackson uh, to, I think, potentially reverse Administrative Johnson's decision in Memorandum December on the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions from stationary sources under the PSD program, the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program. But the ease of these first steps should not be the occasion for self-delusion about the challenges ahead. There's a reason why the Clinton administration did relatively little uh, for the first eight years. Uh, there's a reason for their eight years. There's a reason why, as Ann Carlson pointed out before, DOE did almost nothing uh, during Democratic administrations on the efficiency standards. Yes, the Clinton administration did say that greenhouse gases were an air pollutants with the meaning of the Water Act. That is something that was really easy, but even the Bush administration managed not to do. But then the Clinton administration sat on it. They didn't do anything. They did no meaningful implementation at all under the Clean Air Act. After saying it was an air pollutant, they made no endangerment determinations. They made no effort to even make a movement towards an endangerment determination, to regulate motor vehicle emissions, to regulate stationary sources. And that was with Al Gore as vice president. Al Gore, who had written a book on how compelling and important this issue was before he became vice president. That was with Carol Browner as administrator of EPA for eight years, someone who has spoken out, out loudly and compellingly about how urgent this problem is and passionately. Yes, since then we had the IPCC, 
say it's unequivocal, the link, as they said just about a year or so ago. But for most of us, that was hardly big news. Uh, evident for a long time, there had been a very clear connection between greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. This is not an issue which came out of the nowhere when the IPC finally said it. It just made it even more irresponsible that we weren't doing anything. It was hardly a wake-up call. That happened years ago, and we simply refused to wake up. It should not take enough 25 years to get where we are, perhaps, today. Now, the, there are important lessons, I think, that we did nothing, and I think there are important consequences that we did nothing. The lessons are that it's going to be very hard to get the United States to take the steps necessary now to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's what Dan Farber said, and he's right. It's going to be very hard. Uh, it's going to be hard to actually make the mitigation steps necessary. It's not just hard for Republicans. It's not just hard for Democrats. It's not just hard for industry. It's not just hard for red states. It's not just hard for blue states. It's hard for the United States of America. It's hard for Americans to make these steps, all of us. It's hard for Americans to make the changes needed to avoid the harms that are going to occur to generations from now. It's hard for Americans, I think, now to come to terms with how their wealth is a result of policies primarily are the cause of current global climate change, and how the true devastation, human environmental tragedies that will soon, I think now unavoidably, be witnessed elsewhere in many of the poor and more vulnerable parts of the world are as a result of our choices here at home. It's very hard to get Americans, or any people, to do things for future generations and distant parts of the globe. There are also significant consequences to our delay of the past 25 years. First, much of the greenhouse gas concentrations and the consequences of those concentrations are going to happen anyway. It's too late to avoid. And this, again, is Dan's point from before. In the largest span, all we can do is adapt. We can mitigate harms that are going to otherwise happen. We can't stop many of those harms which are already going to happen. The physics is already at work. Second, because of the delay, it's going to be that much harder to reduce the sustainable levels. It's going to require much more dramatic reductions. This is why Mary Nichols referred to it this morning as wrenching reductions. They could all be wrenching reductions. Because of the delay, it would potentially be an order of magnitude more difficult to get to where we need to go. There are more settled economic expectations, more settled lifestyles that have come into place over the last 25 years, which now have to be undone. And third, and no less important, we have unwittingly promoted other developing nations to replicate our practices during the past 25 years. China and India 25 years ago were very different than China and India today. It's very hard to persuade people in other parts of the world, in developing countries, to change their economies after we have reaped the benefits of our economy. It's very hard to achieve, however, global climate change goals if they don't. So where does that put a bunch of law professors talking about federal preemption, state prerogatives, where do they fit into this picture? And the answer to that question is the second thing I think I learned today. For better or for worse, potentially front and center of that picture. The marketplace is not going to do the heavy lifting necessary. The spatial and temporal horizons of global climate change cause and effect are far too spread out for the marketplace to handle. It's going to require extraordinarily creative and ambitious system of laws to transform our economy, to promote profound changes in the way that we all lead our lives, not by denying human nature, but by working with it. It will have to be a lawmaking moment that will need to rival in significance the lawmaking moment which happened in the early 1970s. In the 1970s, the lawmakers embraced a series of lawmaking innovations that were enormously successful. They created EPA, a really interesting standalone agency, which didn't exist until December 5th of 1970. They also embraced this notion of technology forcing standards, embracing the totally counterintuitive notion that you could achieve better environmental protection results by basing regulation on less information rather than on more information, that sometimes information can be skewed and can be imperfect. And you could be better achieve water quality goals by not having your controls be based on water quality. 